Pastor Smith. And good morning to our full pulpit span. Amen. It's such a blessing to see you all here in the church. And at this time, though, we would like to wish those that are celebrating a birthday a happy birthday. So if anyone is celebrating a birthday this week, please stand so we can sing happy birthday to you. Anyone celebrating a birthday this week? of all ages. So if you're into 
the Airplane Society, go on out there. And if not, go out there anyway, because I'm sure it's going to be a wonderful event to attend. Open house, admission, and parking are free. Uh, the Pomacy of Women's Conference Project is coming to an end next Sunday. I want to remind you that up until next Sunday is the last day that you can make your financial contributions to this project. And this project is intended for students and parents of students who wish to request financial assistance. The conference project form was attached and it is also located in the church lobby, but it was attached to your weekly update email. Please complete and return this form to Pomacea through next Sunday. And the Women's Conference is thanking you in advance for all of your financial support. And we're hoping that we get a lot of young people to apply for this if they need it. Amen? Uh, reiterating that we do have a COVID pro protocol here, and if you don't remember what it is, the um, information is out in the lobby, and it's also was it was given to us back on August 14th. Amen. Now, at this time, we'd like to welcome our first-time visitors to Pomacia. Do we have any first-time visitors? If so, would you please stand? Any first-time visitors?
Remind them we expect to see them again next Sunday. Amen. You know, next Sunday is your Sunday for all of you who did bring graduates. So please bring them back again because we always love to have our youth here in Thomasia. Now for the rest of the youth that are here, can we ask the youth to please stand? All the youth, please stand. One, and two.
to these ministers, Reverend Woods, our assistant pastor, Reverend Giles, Reverend Dr. Giles, Reverend Matthews, Reverend Harrison, Minister Hingston, all of them, we're just grateful these, uh, these uh, individuals are skilled in the word of the Lord. I uh, think of them as travel consultants. If you want to know how to get to heaven, they can tell you. Amen. We thank the Lord for that. Thank the Lord for each of you. We praise the Lord and thank you for the Deacon Dixon, our great music department, Dr. Henderson, and uh, all the true line musicians and our seniors. Again, they do a fantastic job. Very few voices, but they do a wonderful job with those voices. Amen. Amen. And grandparents, we salute you. Amen. So so good to have you here. This is Johnson. Congratulations on having you all of you. We haven't seen you for a while, so it's good to see you, Sister Dorothy. Amen. And uh, all of you, Sister Seven, it's been such a long time. God bless you. It's good to see you here. Amen. Amen. It's good to see all of you. I think that's Sister Higgs back there, Sister Gwen, your crew. Amen. Bless you. Good to have you with us and all of you who are here. I know that I'm missing names. Uh, might cause me some trouble, but hopefully by the end of this sermon we'll be so up on forgiveness that y'all won't hold it against me. <laughs> All right. Well, I uh, also want to give out of uh, Sister Smith in her absence. She's uh, uh, working with a help of her mother uh, in Birmingham, and we're just grateful for the love and for her having some opportunity to spend some time with her. Amen. Again, we are glad that you all are here, and um, my heart is just really burdened with a message from the Lord that I really want to make sure that we all hear, because it's not a message that I think we hear all that frequently, but I think it's so important that it, uh, it really bears a, a, a fan. So I'm going to ask that you will all please stand and turn with me in your Bibles uh, to the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. And by the way, uh, it is important to bring the Word of the Lord with you. Personally, I'm old school and I like the Bibles, but I don't have anything against the electronic formats. They're very convenient. I certainly use them when I'm studying and so forth. But if we can turn to the Gospel of Matthew in the sixth chapter, we're going to read two verses there. I'm reading them from the New International Version, and then after we read that back for us, to those of you who can, please remain standing for a word of prayer. These verses are uh, pretty much smack dab in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, and they read as follows. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. May God bless the reading and hearing doing of his word, let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of your precious Son, Jesus, Lord, we praise you and thank you for your love and goodness and mercy, and we thank you for your grace. And Lord, I thank you, Lord God, for this opportunity to share your word with your people. I ask now, Lord God, that you begin the process of disarming us, Lord God, and, and disarming our resistance uh, against the word, Lord God, if any heart is so inclined, Lord, and let us just be completely open and completely receptive, Lord God, for this is the good news. This is the gospel. This is the good news. And Father, we know that the words that you are telling us uh, are the gateway to life and health and thriving. So thank you again for your mercy. Thank you for your love. Forgive us of all sin and continue to bless your people as only you can. And we thank you for these blessings in Jesus' name. Let every heart say, Amen. Amen. God bless you. And we are finishing up the sermon titled The Liberating Power of Repentance and Forgiveness. And this is part two. Uh, of that sermon. Now last week we introduced the subject of repentance and forgiveness by focusing on repentance. I mentioned at that time that they are a matched pair, very much like how it takes a matched pair to create life in the natural world, right? It takes a, a sperm and an ovum, and when they come together, a new life is created. Uh, they work in concert. They each have their own existence, but they work best when they come in concert together. And, uh, and so uh, that's how repentance and forgiveness are. Uh, and one of the major takeaways that I hope you walked away from last week's sermon, those of you who heard it, is that first of all, uh, the, the, benefit, the three primary benefits of repentance are, number one, it helps us to make peace with God, it allows us to make peace with God. The second thing is that it allows us to heal human relationships. And then the third thing is for personal growth. Uh, all of those things are benefits for repentance. And, uh, and of course, these things have to do with the three types of human relationships that there are. There's really three fundamental types of human relationships. 
our relationship with God, our relationship with others, and our relationship with ourselves. And repentance helps in all three of those. It helps us uh, to have them. And today we're going to talk about forgiveness and the, the power that it unleashes in our lives and the blessings that it unleashes when our, in our lives. These blessings are just as profound, if not more so, than the ones for repentance. Uh, and again, they do work together. And I hope that uh, as we leave today, we'll be even more convinced of what I said last week, that repentance and forgiveness are two keys for unlocking the potential for growth and success that God has granted to the redeemed. Uh, this, the, the potential for growth and, uh, and success that God has granted to the redeemed, repentance and forgiveness unlock those. Now, I said last time that repentance is a mental state. And, and the reason that I wanted to make that point is because it's not like uh, somebody can, can measure you know, uh, either of those things. A uh, mental state is something that happens within our own mind. And for the most part, what happens in our own mind is a private affair because nobody can get into anyone else's mind. Uh, to the extent that you speak and share what's on your mind, people can understand it. But other than that, your mind is a private matter. Um, and so, uh, so we're dealing with a state of mind of forgiveness. And to make sure that we're all on the same page when I talk about forgiveness, let me give you a definition that was given by the, uh, the Greater Good Center, and that's a, a study a group out at UC Berkeley uh, that, that studies sociological things and things like that. Here's, here's their definition of forgiveness. It says, psychologists generally define forgiveness as a conscious, deliberate decision to release feelings of resentment or vengeance against a person or group who has harmed you regardless of whether they actually deserve your forgiveness or not. Okay, so again, let me just read that once more. Psychologists generally define forgiveness as a conscious, deliberate decision to release feelings of resentment or vengeance toward a person or group who has harmed you, regardless of whether or not they actually deserve your uh, forgiveness. Now, there's a, a whole bunch of stuff in here. We could unpack this and, you know, take hours to do that. but. Uh, one of the things I want you to notice is that the words conscious and deliberate were used in that definition. Both of those have to do with mental states. Those, both of those have to do with what's going on in your mind. And like I said, that's pretty much a private affair, except when it comes to God. So the legal system and, and the police and things like that can't really bother you for your thoughts. But God is intimately aware of our thoughts. God is very concerned about our thought life. And uh, last week uh, I talked about the uh, passage in 1 Chronicles 28 and 9 where David was talking to his son Solomon. And he told Solomon that he should acknowledge the Lord and be willing to serve him with a willing mind. And then David said this, For the Lord searches every heart and understands every motive behind the thoughts. Uh, and, and, and so again, he was giving Solomon encouragement to make sure that his thought life was correct before God. Uh, Jeremiah in the 17th chapter, verse 9, says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? But then the 10th verse says, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward a man according to his conduct, according to what his deeds deserve. And so again, uh, this is another statement about God's uh, uh, interest in our thought life. Okay, and so what, and what that means is that whether or not we have actually forgiven someone the way that God wants us to uh, is purely something for God to decide because only He is able to intrude into our thought life and, and know that. Now, uh, I want to I make sure that we know why God is such a champion of forgiveness. And so before I get into the real meat of the message, let me just sort of remind us of a few reasons why, uh, why God is such a champion of forgiveness, why it is so important to Him. Um, the first thing is that it's because it's part of God's nature. It's actually a part of who he is to be forgiven. Uh, in uh, Exodus in the 34th chapter, when Moses uh, was talking to God and trying to atone for what uh, Israel did when they turned against him, uh, Moses, Moses asked the Lord to show me your glory. And the Lord said, I can't show you my glory. It'll, it'll blow your mind. You'll die on the spot. He said, but I'll, 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 I'll let you see my back parts and I'll declare my name to you. And here's what God said in uh, Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 through 7. It says, And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, 
rebellion, and sin. Now, if God is introducing himself to the nation of Israel, he's about to free them from slavery in Egypt, establish them as a sovereign nation in their own right, and he wants them to know certain things about him, about his fundamental nature. And one of the things he lets them know is that forgiveness is an integral part of his fundamental nature. It is part of him to forgive. It is part of who he is and what he is to forgive. And that's a blessing for us because if he didn't have forgiveness as a part of his nature, we'd all be out of love because that's the only way we can involve with him is if he forgives us because we are just uh, sinful at our core. Now the second reason that, uh, that, uh, that God is such a champion of forgiveness is because forgiveness is absolutely necessary for us human beings to have positive social relationships with one another. We're so inherently flawed as beings that there's no way we could maintain positive relationships if we don't have forgiveness, if we're not able to forgive. And if you just think about it, you just know, I mean, a good way to see a family deteriorate and dissolve is for people to be unforgiving and hold on to things. Now, uh, here's a scripture that really illustrates this. It says, uh, that Jesus had been talking about uh, sin and things like that and, and do, doing wrong. And in the 18th chapter of Matthew, verses 21 and 22, it says, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. And Peter thought he was really doing something, right? Seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say unto you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Now, for those of you who want to do the math, that equals 490. But I'm sure the point was that you'll lose count after about 258 or so. So the point is that just don't, don't just do it continually. Do it as much as is needed. And that was the point he was making. So it is necessary for healthy human relationships. The third thing that makes God such a champion of forgiveness, you know, as part of his nature, uh, it helps us to have other relationships. But it is also the mark of a healthy self-perception. It is a mark that, of the fact that we are, have our, our understanding right about the world and, and about our place in it. We're not suffering any delusions as to who and what we are. Uh, uh, look, at, look at what it says here uh, in Proverbs 20 and 9. Because human nature, the faults of human nature are not a personal criticism. It's just a statement about fact. Proverbs 20 and 9 says, who can say, I have kept my heart pure, I am clean and without sin? That's how I saw them speaking, asking a rhetorical question. Can anybody out there say that I have kept my mind my, my clean, I am pure, I have kept my heart clean and without sin? And the answer is, of course not. No one can. The wisest man in the world knew that. And certainly today, all of us should know that. Uh, here's another one that kind of illustrates the same point. First John chapter 1. Uh, Scripture that many of you are familiar with, 8 through 10. John says here, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We don't have a healthy self-perception if we think we are without sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us as our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Verse 10, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. So again, part of having a healthy self-perception as to who you are, the reality of yourself, has to do with acknowledging the fact that we have shortcomings and that we need forgiveness. It is essential that we have forgiveness. Certainly God's forgiveness, but even forgiveness from others. And so what I really want to talk about now is how do we overcome this natural resistance that we have against forgiveness and to make ourselves willing to forgive those uh, who have wronged us. Because I have enough sense to know that there is a natural resistance, at least in our human sin nature, we resist having to forgive people who have done us wrong. So we want to look at how can we overcome those things. Well, uh, I think that, that part of overcoming anything is being motivated to do it. That's one of the reasons when we're not always effective when we're giving advice to people. Because advice only works when the person is motivated to get the thing done themselves. If they're not motivated to get it done, if they're not motivated to work on it, your advice is just falling on deaf ears. Because they're not ready. They're not ready to engage. And, you know, my, what I always say advice is best given when requested. But, you know, that's just me. 
but uh, but but we do need to be motivated in order to, to take on this thing. So I want to give you uh, a few things from Scripture uh, that should motivate us to want to develop uh, forgiveness, for, for to really develop the capacity uh, of forgiveness. Uh, for this to for this to be something that we really excel at. So the first thing that should motivate us is to just realize that forgiveness allows us to be like God. Forgiveness allows us to be like God. Let me share this passage with you. Jeremiah 31 and 34. He says, no more shall every man teach his neighbor. This is talking about the new covenant. Uh, that God is going to uh, uh, have with people. He says, no, no more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Now God, it's interesting, God couples that with people being able to thrive and know him somehow or another, uh, them being unforgiven, and not forgiving has prevented them from doing that. So he says that in this new covenant, I'm going to forgive their iniquity and their sin, and that's going to allow them to thrive with me. Well, it's again, it's God's nature to forgive. He does forgiveness as an act of his volitional will. All by himself on his own, he chooses to act that way. And we human beings have an opportunity to do that. Now, in some ways, we do want to emulate God's behavior, right? I mean, we love to be as powerful as God. We'd love to be able to speak with authority like God. But what the scripture is, 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 is reminding us of the fact that when we choose to forgive as a volitional act of our own will, simply because we choose to, nobody's making us do it, we choose to, you realize that at that moment, you are acting probably as much like God as humans can. Because this is something that God does. God does it in exactly the same way. He chooses to dispense grace on someone by forgiving them. And when we do that very same thing, we are emulating God. We are being about as close to God as we can be as human beings. I just want you to think about that for a minute. Now, another reason uh, that we should forgive is because we have been forgiven. Okay, this is the one that makes us squirm a little bit. Because we have been forgiven. Now, I'm going to go to Matthew, uh, and, and in fact, it's a part of that passage that we just read about Peter, uh, uh, and, and, and the way Jesus deals with this, you know, after he told Peter that about forgiving his brother 70 times, he recognized that, that they were having a hard time being convinced that they really should forgive. So Jesus told them a parable to help solidify this point. He just said, look, here's a different way to think about this. I mean, let me give you a different perspective on why this uh, repentance is so valuable and so important. And so, uh, in the 23rd verse, he begins telling a parable. Now, the parable is, goes from verse 23 to 35. If we were in Bible study, I would go through all those verses. We can't do it here in a passage, but I'll just summarize the, be the beginning for you. Jesus told the story of a guy... Uh, who uh, worked for a rich, uh, rich king, a landowner, uh, you know, some person in the aristocracy. And this, he owed this man a lot of money. He owed him, like, in today's terms, like 100 grand. He, this, this man, uh, the servant, owed this man. And the guy was getting ready to, uh, you know, have him arrested and thrown in jail until uh, he got his money back. And the servant pleaded with him. He said, look, man, I, I, I'm, I'm so sorry. I will, I will give this back to you. But don't do this to me and my family. Cut me a break, man. Cut me some slack. Please don't throw me in jail. And the man, uh, the boss was just compassionate. He said, okay, look, I, I tell you what, I, I'm just going to clean your slate. You're cool. You don't owe me the money. Then the guy, he was happy. He wasn't skipping away. Then he found somebody that owed him $35. Grabbed him by the neck. Said, give up the money, man. I'm going to throw you in jail. And then uh, and the guy didn't have the money, so he had him thrown in jail. It says now, uh, and, and pick up the reading now in verse 31. It says, when the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured 
until he should pay back all that he owed. And then the last verse that ends that chapter says, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. We already said God knows what's happening inside the heart. Jesus said, now, you know, this parable makes a clear and compelling case for us to forgive others. And the reason Jesus told it is because he knew everybody could relate to it. He knew there would be no misunderstanding whatsoever about the point that he was trying to get across from here. The essence is that the man who received the debt forgiveness should have also been willing to give debt forgiveness because he knew his debtor would appreciate it as much as he did. Or at least he should have had enough empathy to realize that. And because he didn't, uh, uh, this, this, this last verse again, that leads us into the third reason. Let me repeat this last verse. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. So my third reason that, uh, it's, that we should be motivated for forgiveness, uh, it, it helps us to be like God and because we ourselves have been forgiven. The third reason is this. Because if we don't forgive, we won't be forgiven. All right. All right. Okay? That's the third motivation. If we don't forgive, we won't be forgiven. Let me go back to our text for today. The, the passages that were in, in the Sermon on the Mount. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sin. Now, Frankly, this statement is troubling. It, it is theologically troubling. And the reason it's theologically troubling is because we've been taught from the very beginning that salvation is all about an act of grace that God gives. It's not about works. Preachers, right? And that would be, and we all been, been, been taught that, right? And so when we, when, we, when we read something like this, it sounds very much like that this repentance stuff uh, is part of, part of works that we have to do. And so it causes a little bit of consternation around that. But one thing you cannot get around, if you read those verses, it is clear that, uh, that Jesus is linking forget getting forgiveness to giving forgiveness. It's clear that he's making that point. Not only that, Jesus, Jesus stressed that point. Because here's the deal. In the Lord's Prayer, I was reading one commentary, and he was talking about the Lord's Prayer. And he said, you know, the Lord's Prayer uh, has just basic Jewish concepts in it that are no different than, than you know, Jesus was raised in, you know, as, a, as an observant Jew, and the Lord's Prayer has, this, those are just basic concepts that would be in Judaism. Our Father, which art in heaven, nothing controversial about that, how would be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Again, very natural things. I'm going to skip a little bit. And then it's not in the temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All of that is known. But buried in there is one little verse that says, Forgive us our debts, as we can also forgive those who are debtor to us, who sinned against us, our debt. Jesus slid that in there. That's different. That's something else. That is saying that God has an expectation of forgiveness on our part that is inextricably linked to our ability to be forgiven. Jesus came to introduce something new in the world. There wasn't anything wrong with Judaism. That religion came down from God personally. But Jesus brought something different that said that there is a higher level of moral excellence that we're concerned and that's what he said. So verse 12 introduces a new concept. And notice that right after Jesus finished that prayer, the only part of it that he went on to elaborate upon was that verse about forgive us our debts as we forgive our debt. He didn't say anything else about the rest of the prayer, but after he finished the prayer, he said this, again, which is our text for today. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men when they sin against you, your, their sin, then your Father will not forgive your sin. So it is clear. Jesus is introducing a new point. He's leaning in on that point. 
And then a few verses later in that parable, he made it clear that this is how this is going to be. Just in case we didn't get it, at the end of that parable, he said, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. So I think the way that this is resolved, the fact that yes, we aren't saved by works, but yes, our forgiveness is conditioned upon the other forgiveness, is this. I think the key to understanding this is that the, the willingness and the ability to forgive others will accompany true repentance. In other words, if we have repented, remember God is searching the heart, if we have repented to the degree and level necessary that God expects and that God wants, then what will go along with that repentance is our ability to forgive others. That will prove that it's really there. In other words, that will prove that we're not just mouthing words. When we say to the Lord, Lord, I please forgive me of my sins. I repent and I want you to save me. God, God will know that we're not just saying words when a change happens within us and we are actually ready to act on that forgiveness. It's kind of like a, a young man trying to convince a young lady that he loves her. Well, if that's the case, Because I know what I'm building it out of. I know what I'm building into my people. 
And that's why his church can still thrive today if we stay focused on him and remember that his ultimate goal for us is the creation of Christian character. This is why forgiveness is so important. It demonstrates that we are living on a higher plane. It demonstrates that we see the actions of others as being subject to their spiritual limitations. That's why we're able to give them a break. That's why Jesus, when he was hanging on the cross, could say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This is what Jesus is trying to do, is create a group of people that have a, a different sensibilities about forgiveness, about the notion of forgiveness. He wants us to just grab onto this and be willing to just forgive like a boss, forgive like it's a superpower. He wants his people to be known and characterized by that capacity. Now I understand that in the lives that we grew up with and whatever our friends and associations were, I'm guessing that forgiveness was never any high on anyone's priority list. Uh, I'm guessing that forgiveness was not something that we, we, we strategized and talked about and helped each other to get to this level of this. But in God's kingdom, it's one of the main things that are important for him. So let me just kind of give a couple of examples to figure out how can we master this art again. It's always good to look at examples to figure out how people have done this. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. I'm going to give you a biblical example, and then I'm going to give you a contemporary example. Kind of like I did last week with repentance. All right, so this week, the biblical example, some of you may have guessed it, that I wanted to really highlight forgiveness and just how important and how powerful it is. And so I'm picking Joseph for that. Joseph and his brothers. Now, uh, Joseph, you all, uh, many of you know the story of Joseph. His brothers was, were jealous of him. He was the next to the youngest son, and his father was one of the son. He was, he was the son of his wife, his father's favorite wife. Jacob had four wives. Rachel was, was childless. All the other women had children. And so, uh, uh, Joseph's brothers were jealous of him. Uh, I mean, it didn't help that his daddy showed so much favoritism. Parents, uh, be sure to note that. If you, if you show favoritism, it's likely to cause some resentment among your siblings, your, the children. But, but, but Joseph's brothers couldn't stand him. They weren't going to kill him. Then they sold him away into slavery. Uh, he wound up becoming a rock star down in Egypt, the savior of the land, and so forth. And, uh, and, and eventually, he invited his family to come back with him. All this time, though, his brothers were still kind of nervous. They were expecting the other shoe to fall. They were expecting Joseph to eventually pay them back. And when Jacob died, uh, that's when they really got scared. Because, okay, daddy's not here now. We know Joseph respects daddy. But daddy's dead now. And Joseph might come out after us. So let's make up this story to tell Joseph to make sure that he won't bother us. And so it says here in Genesis chapter 50, verses 17 through 21, it says, this is what he, they're, they're saying that they're quoting Jacob at this point. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and wrongs that they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of God, of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me. But God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and for your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph had every right to be angry with his brothers and pay them back. And, uh, and, and even though he had reconciled with them, it was 17 years prior to this point that he had met them and brought them into Egypt. But for those 17 years, they were still on pins and needles thinking that Joseph was going to do some kind of retribution against them. And what he was saddened by, the reason that he wept, is, that, is the fact that they still didn't pick up on the fact that he was done with it, that he had forgiven them. He saw it from a different perspective. Yeah, he knew they owed him some pennies, but God had blessed him so abundantly, why was he worried about pennies when he's the richest man in Egypt? And he, he was sad that they could not see this. They could not grasp that. But the blessings that God had given him made him have a different perspective on forgiveness. It brought him to a higher level of living. He didn't have to worry around down there with the lower things of life. God had elevated him to a certain position. 
And so uh, he didn't get delivered. The, the forgiveness wasn't a precondition for him to be delivered, but it was an indication of the mindset that he had achieved after God had already blessed him. That's a biblical example. Now for a contemporary example, I want to share with you the name of Nelson Mandela, a name that we all know and many of us love and revere. This man was in prison for 27 years by the apartheid South African government for the mere crime of simply wanting his people to be treated right. 27 years. If you can imagine your life up to age 27 and all the things that happened and that you did and so forth, for that long, this man was incarcerated until finally things happened and things changed. And on February 11th of 1990, he uh, was freed from, from prison. And he went on, of course, as you know, to be South Africa's first black president. Uh, he also, as the president, he established the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was all about forgiveness. But I want you to listen to a couple of quotes from Mandela about this notion of forgiveness. And one of the things that he said here is that it is a great tragedy to spend the best years of your life in prison. But if I had not been to prison, I would not have been able to achieve the most difficult task in life. And that is changing yourself. I had that opportunity because in prison we have what we don't have in our life outside of prison. The opportunity to sit down and think. That's, that's quite a price to pay. Uh, I would advise that rather than go to prison that we carve out time in our day to really think about this. But the, the, the thinking about it is key. And another quote, forgiveness liberates the soul. It removes fear. That's why it's such a powerful weapon. And when he got out of prison, it was clear that he just wasn't on a war path for vengeance, but he had risen to a higher level. And then the final quote from Mandela, I would say, is that resentment is like drinking poison and then hoping it will kill your enemies. It just, it just does, it's a nonsensical idea. So this is part of what made him a great man. And again, like Joseph, he wasn't necessarily released because he forgave, but he forgave because his character had transitioned and his forgiveness became an important part of him. Forgiveness is important to God. It is just, it is just, it is key. And here's something that I want us to take away. Um, you may not have heard this a lot, and maybe this hasn't been a part of your Christian life up to now. But here's, here's something that I want you to, to take away. And those of you who have the outline, I think it's on there. But, but it says this, God expects me to be liberal, generous, and extravagant in my forgiveness of others. You know, I don't, I'm not uh, the kind of preacher, I don't ask folks to bother the neighbor and stuff like that. Y'all know that's not, that's not our role. But I, but I do want to ask you this. I do want you to repeat this with me a few times. Because I think that saying the words will put them into our consciousness in a different way. So if you don't mind repeating after me, God expects me, God expects me. to be liberal, be liberal. Generous, generous, and extravagant in my forgiveness of others. Let's say it again. God expects me to be liberal, generous, and extravagant in my forgiveness of others. One more time, I won't bother you. God expects me to be liberal, generous, and extravagant in my forgiveness of others. What blessings would God endure us with if it was clear to him that, Lord, this thing that is so important to you, this thing that you have made such a big deal in your Bible, I'm full out trying to get it. I want to master it. I want to be as good at it as you want me to be. How might God bless us when he witnesses that going on in our heart? How might some of the things that we have been asking him for start flowing a little bit more easily because it seems to him that we're concerned about what he said. What kind of gifts would their grandparents give to their children if when they got in, the child went up to them and said, Grandma, I just cleaned up my room and now I'd like to do the dishes for me. What do you think? There's some 
just trying to get over to us. And so, if you're having trouble forgiving someone, let me just kind of give you a few things to think about. Um, and I, I think, again, it's just written on the outline, but let me just kind of just share them with you very quickly here. First of all, ask yourself specifically, what specifically the, the offending party did. Uh, if, you, if there's something that you're holding on to, uh, that you have failed to forgive a person from it. You know, let me just say this. We, we haven't covered all the aspects of forgiveness. Uh, you know, there's always the question of, well, do you have to forgive people if they haven't repented? Uh, do you still have to or not? You know, so I, 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 I can't do all of this in one, in one sermon a day. I'm talking about people that you have the reason not to forgive other than the fact that you just decided to hang, hang on to them. But I, I, wanted, I want you to ask yourself, uh, uh, what specifically did the, did the party do? that you are upset with them about. What was it precisely that they did, okay? Secondly is, <clears throat> how were you personally harmed or impacted? How did this thing impact you? How did it harm you? What was the, the net effect of it on you? And number three, again, these are just questions for consideration. How are you benefiting from not forgiving them? How, what, what benefit are you receiving by holding on and not forgiving them? Number four, what would need to happen for you to be willing to forgive them? In your mind, what do you think would need to happen that for you to uh, be willing to forgive them? And if nothing would allow you to forgive them, then we got some kind of deep issues there. And then the, the final thing, remember that in not forgiving them, you allow them to continue to deprive you of spiritual blessings. They may have done something that harmed you in the past, but that something is continuing to harm you if you won't let it go. If you won't forgive them, that act that they did is continuing, ongoing, to hurt you. And so, uh, Saints, I am. Uh, I, I love God's people. I love each of you. I really want us to take this on. I really want this to be something that we pray about on a personal basis, something that we put on our agenda before God and say, Lord, this is something that I want to achieve. This is something that I want to do. This is something that I want you to help me with. And I believe that if we do that, if, if we do it individually, uh, the Lord can bless us. Certainly if we do it collectively, the Lord will bless his people. So amen. I thank God for his grace and goodness. Now I want to say this to anyone who has not yet accepted Christ. All this forgiveness that we've been talking about. This forgiveness is available to you if you come before the Lord now and let him know, Lord, I have, I have not been following you the way that I should. I have not devoted myself to you the way that I should. But when I realize all that you have done for me and how much you are willing to forgive me for it, Lord, I just want you to accept me, and I am so grateful that you were willing to die for me because I could never repay God for the sins that I owe him. I would never be able to do it. But, Lord, because you died for me, you have opened up the door for me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Would you all please stand? And if there's anyone here who has not yet accepted the Lord, we'd love for you to come right now. This, you can change your eternal address today. You can make the Lord a part of your life today, right now. I want you to come if you've not yet done so. And if you have already accepted the Lord and just simply don't have a church home, we would love for you to join us here at Palmas Eve. Will there be one who will come? Will there be one who will come and become a part of our family here?
goodness of each of you. I want to thank uh, Sister Cassandra Barnes and Sister Tori Johnson for putting together uh, the grandparents acknowledgement and the gift bags that we uh, have in there for you. Uh, so be sure to pick up your gift bag if you are visiting after service. We, uh, we thank the Lord for that. We want to make sure that you, uh, that you pick that up. Amen. And uh, we're just grateful for the Lord for His goodness and for His blessings. And so uh, we look forward again to seeing you next Sunday for you Sunday. We're taking God for His goodness. us to do two things, repent and forgive. And if we can do these two things, it will speed up our personal growth and development towards spiritual maturity. May we stand and may we pray. Our gracious Father, we're so thankful and grateful for a loving pastor who loves us very dearly, a pastor who is a shepherd. A shepherd is concerned about his and her sheep. Our beloved pastor is concerned about us, our spiritual growth and development towards spiritual Christian maturity. So, Heavenly Father, in the words of Michael Jackson, the man in the mirror, help us to look in the mirror, see ourselves, anything within us that is not pleasing in your sight, allow us to repent. And then ask those whom we have harmed or hurt to forgive us. So we will be unleashed and the Spirit of God will speed up the growth and development towards Christian maturity within us. This is our prayer. May we take these sermons, eat them, grow and develop from within. Then we can reach out. Now the grace of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with us both now, henceforth, and forever. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.